There we go. Right on time. Must be about time, huh? <coughs> so let's start with our normal um, protocol. 30 seconds quiet time to deal with fellowship issues or uh, if you're in fellowship, petition issues. Um, and then I'll start it with a prayer. So let's start now. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to understand these great truths that you have, these spiritual truths that are divine viewpoint. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, help us to put everything aside for the time being just to be with you and your word and to uh, understand these uh, principles and apply them to our lives. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we are on September 25th. 2022 Sunday, we're on Galatians 4, 29 through 31, and that should actually wrap this chapter up. Um, and I haven't decided whether we're going to do a summary uh, next Sunday. Sometimes the summary gives us a much better view because we're kind of standing on top of it. So uh, uh, I'm suspecting we will, and then we'll go into chapter 5. <coughs> so let's start with the verse. We'll just start from right up here. Um, at that time, the son was born. The son was born according to the flesh. That would be Ishmael, persecuted. The son born by the power of the spirit is the same now. So, what does this mean? What we're looking at now is we're looking at how one seed of Abraham treats the other seed of Abraham. And I think you'll find it very insightful because he's using it in the allegory, not so much specifically for that, but for in reality, the allegory part of it. He's using the historical truth of what happened and presenting a spiritual allegory that's even true today. So it's very insightful. Um, the according to the flesh would obviously be Ishmael and the power of the spirit uh, would be uh, Isaac. The, the points here are that the according to flesh side is being according to the spirit side. And the spirit being the miracle of God itself. We talked about that last week. Now the word persecuting here um, is an active voice, which means he kept on persecuting. Uh, meaning that Ishmael kept on persecuting um, uh, Isaac <clears throat> in, the, in the historical sense. And we'll read the verse that this kind of is quoted from. And to, the threat is really about freedom and security, and that in reality, um, Ishmael would not leave Isaac in peace. And this is what causes the whole issue. In reality, Ishmael is grudging um, him, Isaac, because of his priority in, in not only God's plan, but also in his family's plan, and in Abraham's plan, God's plan for Abraham, but also in his privileges. And this is the same thing that the Judaizers are doing, and this is going to be the point that he brings out. And at the time here, the word at the time, is talking about 2000 BC, so it's 4,000 years ago. Um, and the, the part where it's talking about according to the flesh is really talking about in the ordinary way. The, 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 the contrast is not only flesh to divine, uh, flesh to spiritual, but it's also the ordinary way compared to the miraculous way. And that's the part you want to keep in, keep in, in, in sight here. The pers persecuted one, like I said, it means keep on persecuting. And so he's mocking him. Uh, in reality, he's causing him problems. And this is the interesting thing about this, that this, this actually uh, happens for the last 4,000 years. Okay? So since this is first in, uh, given as an insight, in reality, this keeps going on. And there's a, a, um, a, a tribe called the Hagarites, and hopefully you picked up Hagar, Hagar, the, the mother, the slave mother, and it's, it's um, H-A-G-A-R-I-T-E-S. 
and it means this, it means uh, it's Hag Hagar, the slave woman, and in reality, it, um, it it's actually the sons of Ishmael, and they will persecute the sons of Isaac through the four thousand year history of the two of them. Now God knows this, and when Paul is speaking to this, Paul knows this too. Now we don't know it because most people don't have that kind of history. But in reality, this in this piece here, there is that parallel of not just the two sons and not just the flesh versus the spirit. And in reality, a legalism versus spirituality, grace. But it's also, in fact, in reality, these two fleshes um, uh, actually are adversarial to each other or enemies to each other. Animity is the word for thousands of years, okay? <clears throat> um, and and uh, we are included, by the way, where it says here that I think the most coolest part, it says, born by the power of the Spirit. Now, if you, if you look at that particular principle, it means that in reality, the Holy Spirit here, the power of God, actually was responsible for the birth of, uh, of Isaac. <clears throat> and if you look at it in reality, he is he, God the Holy Spirit, is responsible for the birth of Christ. He is actually the responsibility, he is the power and the responsibility of the birth of you and I with respect to the um, changing of the new creature, the new, new, new creation. We are a new creation. We are, we are uh, God's actual children by this exact same power and this exact same intervention by the Holy Spirit and His power in the plan of God. Okay, so if you look back at this, this is this is really what He's saying here. The point of this whole thing here is that in this piece where it says it is the same now is the conveyance that Paul is looking at all of this and he's saying it's the same now. You know, and when he speaks this, in reality, he's speaking about two thousand years ago. Interestingly speaking, the Word of God is true for always. So in reality, this happens even today, meaning that legalism always persecutes grace, even today. Even in the church today, this takes place. And that, that's this piece here. It is the same today. Legalism, the way of the flesh, always persecutes and mocks grace, even now, 4,000 years after this takes place. And this is the way because one side of the flesh, even though it's normal, in reality, the parallel for the allegory is that uh, things that are done by flesh, human flesh, human works, are on the absolute opposite of those, those things that are done by God. Yet, even today in Christianity, we see that the human effort, the human works part, is the part that is glorified within the church. Um, it is the part that is taught about. Uh, and it actually fits very nicely with us as human beings, which is why we're so prone to it. Uh, we even have it today, the work ethic. Uh, and the work ethic is a legitimate work. It actually is sustained from the garden, that principle. But in reality, men are happier when they actually achieve it themselves, even though in reality they are con contrary to God in this sense. And all the stuff that happens here, all this persecution, originally started when Hagar took his wife's suggestion and decided to have Ishmael be fulfilled as his child from the promise that he understood. Remember him and, him and Sarah got together and figured that was a good idea. And what it did, it produced a human work. And that human work has been part of this persecution for 4,000 years and shows up everywhere as a principle, as always being the, uh, the enmity, the enemy, of God himself, okay? That's the whole point here. Legalism always bullies grace. It happens in every church. Every church we have been to, we have found that to be true. It's still true today. In reality, legalism still bullies grace. Romanism did this for hundreds of years. It happened in the Reformation. It is the history of the church is complete with it, okay? If you're familiar with... Uh, um, um, the, the, the persecution that France from Catholicism did to Protestantism, it happened there. Spain did the exact same thing. 
and um, Romanism has done this forever. The Dark Ages is where legalism actually overtakes the church and becomes its primary uh, modus operandi, it, the way in which it conducts itself. The church becomes legalistic, and because of that, the light of the Holy Spirit is not present in that respect. So the Dark Ages are called that for a very good reason. This is the same as going on with the Jews when they persecuted Paul, stoned him. Same with the Judaizers, what they did to Paul, as are the Galatians who were Christians are doing to Paul. We have seen this through the whole chapter. So you see this, this repeated theme. And why is it, is, it a, is it a theme? In reality, it's a doctrine of truth. Okay, What does it mean to us? I'll just boil down some of the pieces here. We're going to, of course, it doesn't give anything. We're still going to go over everything. But the boiling down piece that you need to remember is that when you do something uh, from the flesh that God requires of you to do through the Spirit, you are, on, you are on the opposite side of God. Okay, And when you uh, have uh, human works, and that's done all the time in the church today, when you have that as the primary way of executing the church's business and the believer's way of life, you are on the opposite side of God. And that's what this is supposed to tell us. Over and over, history here is replete with it. And we'll, and we'll get to a little bit of that. So let's go to some of the verses we have here. Um, the first one is Genesis 21, 8 through 9. That's where this actually comes from. You notice he didn't quote it. He quoted the principle. Okay? And the reason he did that was so that it would be easier for us to get the point. The uh, Genesis uh, 21, 8 through 9 and I call this the grudge against uh, those of privilege. That is so common today. It is so common. It's an evil principle. It has nothing to do with privilege. Uh, if, if we were, if Christians were to be against privilege today, we would be against Abraham. We would be against David. We would be against Solomon. We would be against Daniel. I mean, it goes on and on. In reality, privilege is granted by God himself for the things that make a difference, okay? Lots of people have money, and money becomes a thing that they, in reality, that persecutes the person that has it. The person of grace enjoys the money because he enjoys God, and then the money actually becomes kind of an aside that blesses him too, and God does that, as he did with Abraham. So it says here, the child grew, my Isaac, and was weaned, on the day Isaac uh, weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the, the Egyptian, <coughs> uh, had born to Abraham, was mocking him. Okay, so what we have there, let's just take the picture of that. This little guy who's just been weaned, he's two to three years old, Isaac. And at this point, um, uh, Ishmael is somewhere between 15, 16, 17. Can you imagine that picture? And he's taunting him. In reality, he would always taunt him. He would always persecute him. He always threatened him. And that's what would happen here. So when you look at it, let's take a step back from, the, from that piece that we're looking at, is that re, what Sarah sees here, and we'll read the reaction to it in the next verse, but what she sees him is this persecution taking place. Now the great feast here that Abraham is giving is a, is a feast to God. In reality, a feast to this miracle child, this miracle of the Holy Spirit from the 100-year-old Abraham and the 90-year-old uh, Sarah. I suppose now they're 100, he's 103 and she's 92. <clears throat> so that miracle that should be great, a great feast in reality is mocked even then and threatened from the one who is the miracle child. That's the truth of it. Now, what I like about the Word of God is it, it, it cuts to the chase, it tells the truth, and if we were to put this story out someplace, everybody in the world would be saying, how unfair, okay? Because you'll see what happens as a result of this. Why is one privileged and the other is not? Why do we have eternal life and those who do not believe uh, don't have it? In reality, it is in God's plan to do that thing. It's called the divine decrees. Now, the first thing I want to look at is there's a progression that takes place here from these three verses, just to back us up for a second. And if you have your Bible, you can flip it open here. But in Galatians 4.23, note the progress here. Okay? 
I'll read it and then I'll tell you what it is. He says, The son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son uh, by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. Okay, so what we find here is this child that we're looking at, as we are in reality, we, are, we have a parallel with this. We are part of the divine promise. Watch the, watch, the, watch the progression that we have here. And that promise is coming from, a, from an oath of God who did in eternity past and what we call the uh, divine decrees of eternity past before any of this ever took place. Galatians 4.28, here's another piece of it. It says, know the progression again. They are called, he is called and they are called and we are called children of the promise. So this includes us in it. Now, now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, we just read this last week, are children of promise. He's of promise. We are promised. That's what it's saying right here. We are, we are in reality, the succession of that promise through history. In reality, it was promised by God on an oath from God when he actually promised it in eternity past to Abraham. And that succession went down to Isaac, and that succession went down to you and me. We are part of that plan. We are part of that promise. And that's what he's trying to tell us here, that this is how it is. The um, Galatians 4.29, the one right now, let's reread it and include those two in it. We went from divine promise to the children of promise. Okay. Finally, finally it is executed, both the promise itself, the oath itself, the children as being part of the promise, meaning us, because that's what that included there. In reality, we are born by the power of the Spirit. We are born. We are unique. Christians are unique. Okay? As is Isaac. In reality, we are a miracle of God, as we are, as we are a child of God. And this verse says, and we'll just read it again so we get that piece of the emphasis, at the time the son was born according to the flesh, persecuted the son that was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It is the same now. It is that Holy Spirit who executed the oath of God. And every promise that God has, he will execute it just like this one. In reality, all the promises of spiritual growth, all the promises of Christianity from the time that you're saved until the time hopefully you mature, all those promises were promised to you and to me as they were in eternity past. God has them and they're just waiting for us to claim them as we did when we had faith in Christ. And we, by doing that, we secured the promise of God. The first one, now this is just a reference piece. I'm going to read it. There's, there's other ones. I'll give you the verses, two of them. Um, I think I might have put one of them up here. Yeah, I'll put one there. Um, it's First Chronicles 5.10. Ishmael's son would always be the sworn enemies of Isaac's sons for thousands of years. This, this comes up over and over again. The problem is that most people don't know the history, and we don't know the Hagar, Hagarites are. During, the, during Saul's reign... Okay, this is a thousand years. This is part of what Paul knew when he wrote this, including this in this principle. Uh, during Saul's reign, if you remember that's 1000 BC, um, they raged war against the Hagarite, Hagarites um, who were defeated in their, in their hands. God gave them over to them. And, and, they, and they occupied the dwellings of the Hagarites throughout the entire region of the east of Gilead. Now, that also shows up in verse 19, shows up in a pl couple places in here, also shows up them specifically, God naming them, and that'd be an R A there, God naming them even in Psalms 83, 6. And what does that do? That allows us to confirm what's said here. It allows Paul to actually watch this history and say, look, it, this is always going to happen. The flesh will always persecute the spiritual through all, all time. And this is part of that documentation that he has. Now the, um, the, the principles here is that as Ishmael persecuted uh, um, Isaac, spelled his name wrong, almost said it wrong. <laughs> as Ishmael did that, in reality, the, the, the use of that word and that principle is to help us understand that not only did the Judaizers did that to Paul, we talked about that about two weeks ago. 
In reality, the Jews did that for the first hundred years, in fact, even longer, uh, longer than the first hundred years. But if you remember when we were in the seven churches in Revelation, they even did it then, okay? So they've done it over and over again, meaning those of the flesh persecuted those of the spirit, which were the Christians. Um, they tried to claim the inheritance after the flesh and ignoring the, and, and follow the ordinances of the flesh. And that's the mistake, see? It is the following of the ordinances of the flesh, which is the law in this particular case, but it's also legalism within the church where we are, chain, we are claiming things of the law, okay, that we expect to have the inheritance of the spirit by doing the things of the flesh. And it doesn't work that way. That's this very point. And we'll get to that verse in the, in the next, which, is, which God will make very clear. Um, the note of the power of legalism. This is something that's really important to uh, understand. The power of legalism is crazy power. It is really, really phenomenal. What we see in the crucifixion of Christ is legalism over spirituality. Okay, Remember, who put, who put him on that cross? It was actually the spiritual leaders, I mean, that use that word loosely, religious leaders of Israel who put him on there. They hated him. Crucify him. Crucify him. That's hatred. It's hatred not just for Christ. It is hatred for the way of life that God has ordained for us. And it is hatred of God himself. It is antagonistic. It is the opposite. How the Jews stoned Paul in Lystra, which was actually a city in Galatia, if you remember. The riots the Galatians had, if you remember that, in the first missionary journey and the second. How the Judaizers demonized Paul and his team, threatening him and turning the, his Gentile church, the, Jews train, the Judaizers who were Christian Jews, turned his Gentile church that he founded, we know that from first missionary journey, against him and made them like themselves. Never underestimate the power and the hatred of legalism, even within the church, maybe I should say, especially within the church. Let's go to verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Now, if you have this today, and you put this on social media, the amount of flack you would put up with would be crazy, because there would be a determination to have equality. And most of us feel that. Okay, We feel that. But in reality, we are corrected by God. And this helps us understand how much we have been, in reality, indoctrinated by the world. In reality, God himself will straighten this out, and we'll read about it. But know what it is. This is a command, okay? It's a command. The slave woman and her son, okay? Get rid of them. Throw them out, okay? We'll read that right here. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance. That's a principle. Okay? That's, that's not just an angry, angry woman. That's a principle of God, and we'll see that, with a free woman's son. Now, the parallel to this is with flesh. In reality, is that legalism will never share in the inheritance of the grace people. They won't. They can't. This is not only true for spirituality. It's also true in the rewards in eternity. Because the legalists use the flesh as a way of producing their, their works. In reality, we know from uh, 1 Corinthians that those works will be burned and they will not get the inheritance that they think they're going to get. Why? It's because they are doing something God has told us clearly not to. And those people who do it by grace, and that grace is the filling of the Holy Spirit for us as Christians, that is, that is the way that happens. That grace was given to us. That power is done by God. That's what grace is. We didn't do it. We followed what God asked us to. We did what he asked us to. In reality, he produced all the eternal effects of that. 
Who can produce eternal effects other than God? And that's the inheritance both in salvation, but also in Christianity in time and in eternity for the gold, silver, and precious stones that we see at the judgment seat of Christ. Only to the free person. Okay? Keep that principle in mind because that's really the one he's going after here. Okay? These two ways of life. And this is a quote, like I said, from Genesis 21.10. We'll read that. And this is a quote right out of the, the Septuagint like it was before. Um, now what the, what, the, what the scripture says here, this piece is, but what does the scripture say? He's trying, to, he's trying to orient us. Okay, why is it true? Why do you have to be oriented? Because your thinking is automatically wrong. Unless you have divine viewpoint and you have substantial amount of Bible doctrine, you will get this wrong. Okay? You'll, you'll see that. But what will happen is that when somebody says to you, but what does the scripture say? The right Christian, I mean rightly oriented, will reconcile their viewpoint and match it up to God's as absolutely true because God said it. Without thinking any more about what they feel or think, they will correct their own viewpoint. Okay? And that's what he's doing here. Okay? What does it say? It is God speaking here. This is the divine viewpoint of what God thinks of human works. That's what it is. Um, get rid of the slave woman. This is actually uh, in the imperative. And if you look at who the object is, and then we'll see it in a second when we read the verse, the object is Abraham. This is Sarah telling Abraham what to do. Okay? Now, we're going we're gonna to laugh on it because... <laughs> My joke was when I look at this thing is that um, you look at Sarah and you look at Abraham and what she's doing is she's telling Abraham what to do. She's kind of, the, 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 uh, uh, the imperative here is kind of a scream, okay? She's not asking for his permission. She is telling him what to do, okay? And what I like about this is that this is rightly oriented to the word of God and Abraham has a responsibility to obey it, even if he doesn't want to. And we'll see in the verses that he doesn't want to, okay? Now, the other time that she said something to him, which was, why don't you take my maidservant, that's when Abraham should have said, no, God will do this by his Holy Spirit. He will do it by his own power, and we don't have to help him. If he had done that, thousands of lives would not have been destroyed. Thousands of lives. This, these battles and these, and these things went on for years, killing both sides on battlefields, and hatred, and animosity towards not just these people, but also the Edomites that are also mentioned in this, in this same uh, verse up here. Okay, we're also Arabs. It would have changed everything. You would not have had that animosity, and all those deaths, and all those bad things that happened from it. That's what happens when you disobey what God has told you so very clearly and you do not depend on his grace of his Holy Spirit to execute it in the eternal way. Hopefully you got that part. Okay? Scripture shows that God himself rejects Abraham's children after the flesh for this, for this piece, the inheritance he's talking about, the divine inheritance. Now we find out, and we'll read it in the other part, that in reality, does God give things and bless them in time? Yes, he does. But does that guarantee anything in eternity? No, it doesn't. Okay, so God will take care of Abraham's children, as he will take care of uh, Isaac's son, Esau. He will be blessed in this time. But because Isaac rejected in reality, the inheritance that he got as the first son, he too missed out on the eternal rewards. And today, we know from Scripture that Esau is in hell today. He had a wonderful life. He was the king. He actually had 12 sons. And those 12 sons had 12 tribes, and they all became kings of nations. Just like the blessing says for Abraham, he will become many nations. We know that. But did they get the divine promise? Did they get to share in this? And the answer is no, they did not. Because in reality they rejected Jesus Christ. 
And it says here, never will they share. Okay? This is a demand for, re for, for Christians to reject human works, human solutions. Many of us are looking forward to the, to the elections coming up and we maybe even have somebody in mind who's going to solve the problems of the country and we're going to be all doing wonderful. That is a human solution. Right now, my opinion is that we're under discipline, both as a church and as a country. In reality, that discipline will play out just like it does in Leviticus 25. Hopefully, just in the fourth cycle of discipline, what we've talked about. But that discipline is deserved. In reality, if there is anything to be raised up, it'll be raised up by God himself. And it won't be a solution of a man. It will be a solution of spiritual means where the church remembers that it's supposed to be under the power of the Holy Spirit and execute the plan of God through that power and that power only. That will change this country. That will change unbelievers. That will change the way this country works. But that is the divine solution because it is the one by the power of the Holy Spirit. The inheritance it's talking about is co-heirs with Christ. For us, it is all that comes with that. The blessings in time, from what we have learned to call maturity, spiritual maturity, or super grace blessings, as we've also used that word. We've, we, we've taken that from another pastor and many others, I suppose. It actually comes from James 4, 6. But the, um, the other part, so for Isaac, that would include the millennium. That would include the Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant, which is the return of Christ as king. The Palestinian covenant, which is one about the land. It would include all those. Those are his inherited inheritance. And the millennium being his one in eternity. That goes beyond that. For us, as co-heirs of Christ, because we're in the same thing, we not only get the blessings that spiritual maturity brings as a result of that, which God will bless us in time. In time, like right now with things that are wonderful and great beyond understanding. But also, we will be blessed even more so in eternity when we cross over. The greatest day that will happen for us is when we die, when we cross over. Everything will be beautiful. Everything will be stand, uh, taken care of. We will not be unstable anymore. We will have the stability of the Spirit that God has cultivated through His Holy Spirit and the Word of God in our souls. That's what we will be. It will be the most stable Ever. The free, the free woman's son. Scripture shows us that God is in favor of Abraham's children after the Spirit, born by the Spirit, by faith. Those that's for true for Isaac. It ends up being true for Jacob, although we don't see that here in this thing. It ends up being true for us as Christians. Now the verse we have here is the part I was talking about. We're going to get a little quoting of the verse itself, plus a little extra. In Genesis 21, 10 through 12, God said, Sarah says, and God confirms it, no inheritance. Never. Sounds cruel, huh? They demand the things from the flesh, and they get only the things that come from the flesh. Those who live by the Spirit get what comes from the Spirit. That's true whether you're a Christian who lives by the flesh or by the Spirit, that same principle is true. It only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the point. So this is what Sarah actually says that he takes the first part of this quote from. Verse 10. <clears throat> and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for the woman's son will never uh, share in the inheritance of my son Isaac. Isaac, the promised child. The one who was created from God the Holy Spirit himself, as we were when we became saved. The new creature we are is the new creature that we have from the birth of the Holy Spirit at the time of salvation, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when we became born again. That's what they call it. Born from above, as, as Christ said to Nicodemus. Verse 11, take it a little further. You'll see this confirmed by God. <clears throat> Verse 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because he was concerned uh, for his son. Verse 12. But God said to him, notice how, notice how, listen how gracious God is to him. I don't really like it. It's just so kind. But God said to him, 
Do not be so distressed about the boy, talking about Ishmael, and your slave woman, Hagar. Listen to what Sarah tells you. See, that is God confirming exactly what Sarah said. And it goes on to say, because it is through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. Okay? That is his legitimate offspring. The, the spiritual one, the one promised by God and comes from God. We are, same, we are part of that spiritual um, offspring. If you remember verse 28, we are the offspring of Isaac also because we are part of that miracle because we too were born of the Holy Spirit. The next verse confirms this, and I, br I bring this up because this one would be the one that helps us orient ourselves correctly, and it's from John 8.35, <clears throat> right here. And we, read it ago, we read it about three weeks ago. He says, Now a slave has no permanent place in a family, but a son belongs to it forever. Okay? And that's us. So let's read the principles we have, uh, we derive from this. Paul makes clear the principle not understood by the Jews for centuries, or by the Judaizers, who were Christians, okay, the Christian Jews, at the time of the writing of this. He makes it clear to them. He takes their scripture and he pulls out the allegory that they too had for hundreds of years, but did not understand this great principle that we have had, uh, was elucidated, clearly made to us, so that we understand this great truth. Two, the most important principle here is separation. Separation. Separation from what? Great Christians must separate themselves from legalistic Christians, just like here. This is, hard, this is hard to see and hard to do. But they will always persecute you. And in reality, they are not the same substance you are, meaning that they have a different plan. And that is a fleshly plan that is of the devil, as opposed to ours, which is of God. And how do I know that? It's because that's what this allegory tells us. Okay. There is no compromise here. Legalist will never inherit what God has promised. Only those who live by grace and are saved by grace have that promise. So even legalistic Christians who are indeed saved will never get the inheritance, that inheritance in time and that inheritance in eternity. They will not get it. The other part is remembering that just as remember so that you, so you separate the two of these, that in reality when Isaac was born was 50 years after um, Abraham was saved. 50 years after. Okay? So what that tells us is that this promise of God, this oath of God, was not given as a result of Abraham's salvation. It was a result of Abraham's maturity. In reality, the covenant of circumcision is one that belongs to all super grace believers, all mature believers. It's not salvation. It's 50 years after salvation. Okay? So if you look back at Abraham, Abraham's like 50 years old when he becomes saved. Does he get his promise? Do those promises take place? No. He has to wait until he gets mature. And when is he mature? We learned about that. When he had absolute faith that God could produce an offspring in both him who was actually sexually dead. Nothing worked. Nothing worked in Sarah. God promised it, and Abraham believed it, it says in Hebrews chapter 6. He believed it without equivocation. What is that? That's when the, that's when the Word of God is more powerful than anything else. It is your foundation of your life. That's spiritual maturity. And that is when the promise took place. Remember that. The promises, the great promises, are just like this one. In reality, when that spiritual maturity takes place, the promises flow from it, both in time and in eternity. And the result of that, look at this from this point of view, the result of that miraculous child that he was mocking is the foundation for every believer who ends up in heaven. All of them. Millions and millions. 
That's what that is. It's divine perspective that helps us see. And if we had, if he had gone with the flesh, in reality, he would have had to reject his son, and his son, the miraculous son, would have never been born. Legalism always persecutes grace. Stay away from it. The law, and this is from J.B. Lightfoot, written in the 1800s, so it's not new, okay? It's 300 years old almost. Law and grace cannot coexist. Legalism and grace cannot coexist in the church. It can't even exist in your family. It can't even exist in us with having, without having conflicts. And J.B. Lightfoot also says, the law must disappear before the gospel, the gospel of grace. Let's read the last verse. Now, before I read this verse 31, I want you to notice the shift from the third person to the first person. What does that mean? Okay, It means from them to us, or to we in this case. There's a shift here that he brings on his last conclusionary marks on the allegory. Okay, He says, therefore, now, therefore is a word of conclusion. Brothers and sisters, we, that's the first person, plural, we, meaning Paul, meaning Galatians, meaning you and me. We are not children of the slave woman, but of the free. Now, the therefore part here is a conclusion, but it includes all of us. In the summary of the allegory, he brings it home to us as Christians. Okay? The Christians and the Galatians. Those who walk in grace. The thing that says we are not, this is actually the present active indicative. So it says we are continually, not is the word ook, it's the most powerful negative. So it says we are not, okay, that's what it says, children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now the inference here is, on this part, we are not children, why he uses that power of that, of, of that grammar that is actually there for us, but we don't see it. It is an inference on the obligation of every believer. What is that inference? Is that we are not bond servants. servants. We are not people of the flesh. I wish I could scream it, but I'd scare my wife, then the camera would fall over and all kinds of bad things would happen. But in reality, we are not, and we should not act like it. The obligation is written here for us to remember we are not people of the flesh. We are people of the Spirit. We are people of grace. We are people of the power of the Holy Spirit, and it is God's power that makes that difference from the time we're born again until the time we enter heaven. But, strong conclusion, but of the free woman. Now, there's some interesting things here, just as a note, and it's kind of interesting. I'll, it doesn't show up in the English. I put a question mark up here, but the present active indicative. But see this word right here? It doesn't, it's, not in the, it's not in the Greek. See this word right here? It is in the Greek. Now, why is that true? Okay, the word says it's not in here because it should be a slave woman. <clears throat> when you're missing the definite article, which is the word the, you replace it with an a, uh, in the thing, which means ah uh, is, is the same as saying any. Any slave woman, any kind of legalism, whether it's heathen legalism, whether it's world legalism, whether it's church legalism, whether it's law legalism, don't go under any of it. We're not part of that. But this one here, this definite article is actually in there. It's actually in the Greek. And what it tells us is that we are specifically of Sarah. We are specifically of the grace of Christ. We are specifically of the church. C-H-U-R. Church, anyway. We are the church. We are this free woman. And only that one. She is our only spouse. An emphasis on the category to love of the spouse. One and only. This is a very similar doctrine, just as a note, to Galatians 3.27. It's kind of the doctrinal side of this picture that he ends up with, just like he did in the chapter before. And it says, it's a different form, but it says the same thing. For all of you, Galatians and Christians, 
who were baptized by the Holy Spirit, not by water, into union with Christ. You're baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves, put on Christ, put on the new creation. The, we used to call it the uniform of glory. You yourselves are in Christ and with Christ. Same doctrine. Now the principles we have here <clears throat> as the conclusion of this chapter is that when you put one foot in legalism as a believer, you will end up persecuting the church. That's always true. It happens with anybody who does it. It is a principle that God counts as the highest. And this is what the Galatians have done to their dear teacher and friend and fellow believer, Paul. The conclusion Paul draws here <clears throat> by the allegory is that Christians are not bondage <clears throat> to any legal statutes, including the law. We've heard that before. And their relationship to God is that of sons, born of the Holy Spirit, true sons of the God by faith, and therefore grace and grace alone. Doctrine shows us here that there's an inseparable barrier, and it's important for us to remember that because it's easy for people to get into legalism. And what God's saying here is, Paul saying here is, don't do it. You're either with me or you're not. Now, it doesn't change our eternal status with him, but you're either walking for me or you're not walking for me. And when you walk in legalism, you have violated that inseparable barrier. You've walked to the other side. This is the same difference between the two different seeds. Birth um, is done by the Holy Spirit, provides God's power in ensuring the inheritance. It ensures the inheritance. It is seals the inheritance, but only to one seed, and that's the seed of grace. The other has none. That's an important thing to remember when you're doing things in human flesh. This can never change. It hasn't changed in 4,000 years since this was written. It will not change today. It will never be fixed. There is no amount of human effort that can change it. In conclusion, God's system is grace in the power of His Holy Spirit, a spiritual birth and a spiritual life, the filling of the Holy Spirit. There's not a second one. Let's close. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to remember that we walk in your truth. You do all the work. We just do the things you ask us to. And it is your power behind all of that that we do with grace that executes everything. Just as you brought us to this side, so you will bring everything that we do into eternal grace and righteousness. And we will be rewarded and blessed in time and in eternity. And those who pick up the flesh and decide it is their efforts are the ones who lose because there's no inheritance for them and never will be. Lord, I pray for your blessing on us. Help us to think about these things in our Christian lives. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.